Hi, everyone. My name is Tyler Olson. I am one of the production directors here at Reimagine 2020. Welcome back to another edition of Reimagine 2020 virtual events, where we get to showcase some of the leading developments in the blockchain and cryptocurrency industry by talking with those actively building and conducting business within the space, and where we also get the chance to showcase some of our onboarded university students from all around the globe uh, to highlight some of the up and coming talent. Um, this event in particular is our fifth event. Um, it's themed Happy Hoddle Days, where, of course, we're playing off the crypto meme to hodl, hold on for dear life, and where we want to celebrate the holidays and a successful year for crypto, in my opinion, um, here at the end of the eventful year, which has been 2020. Um, with that said, what we want to do this time is, um, in addition to hearing from uh, some of our industry partners and uh, new friends about the exciting and developments that are taking place, uh, we also want to get a sense of um, this year in review from those leaders uh, that we have a pleasure to talk with. In case you've missed any of our previous events, be sure to check out our YouTube channel, Reimagine 2020. And of course, be sure to follow us on all of the relevant social media channels at Reimagine underscore 2020. Um, lastly, be sure to check out our podcast series on Spotify at Bitcoin Radio, where you can hear all previous and future interviews of Reimagine 2020 virtual events to date. Joining me right now is Richard Yan. Richard is co-founder and COO of Vite Labs. Um, Vite Labs is a highly scalable smart contract platform built on Block Lattice, DAG, and DPoS. Um, also worth noting, and uh, what I'm very excited to get into with Richard about is um, Richard is the host of a bi-weekly podcast entitled The Blockchain Debate Podcast, which showcases nuanced disagreement from thought leaders in the space, which um, I think is a very important aspect that we'll get to because Lord knows there's a lot of disagreement in the space and, um, you know, we here at Reimagine especially value conversation around those kinds of issues. So I look forward to hearing what Richard has to say with what they're doing um, on their podcast. So without further ado, Richard, thank you so much for joining me today. Before we get into the conversation, let me ask you, um, how are you? Where are you in the world? And, uh, you know, what's been the highlight of your week? Oh, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. I am located in San Francisco Bay Area. So the project that I am a co-founder of has two headquarters, one in Beijing, China, and one out here in San Francisco Bay Area, which is where I am based. And my week has been generally good. I think this week has been a very interesting week for crypto space in particular because Bitcoin is near its all-time high again. So that sort of if you're measuring the popularity or the adoption just by the price alone, this is obviously a very bullish sign. And all kinds of altcoins have been floated as a result of Bitcoin's price rising. So I'd say I've been having a pretty good week. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely been an exciting week for those of us that have some skin in the game, because as you mentioned, Bitcoin is approaching all time high and uh, you know, as you also mentioned, all coins are kind of lagging behind, but hopefully they'll have their sort of shine in uh, moments to come. Um, oh, I'm saying some all coins have already been coming up a little bit. Oh, I mean, sure. I, I suppose if you're measuring them in fiat terms, that's obviously the case. If you're measuring in BTC terms, then not so much. But sure. we're seeing ETH come back to 500 US dollars now. And that's usually a leading sign for other alts to follow. Yeah. Well, let's just hope for the best there. Um, you know, before we get into hearing a little bit about um, Vite Labs, maybe you can share some of your background. How did you get into the cryptocurrency and blockchain space? Um, and how did that kind of lead you to where you are today with Vite Labs and the uh, podcast? Yeah, so I was in traditional finance. I was on Wall Street for about 10 years. I worked for Goldman Sachs and Two Sigma. And then I've always known I'm an entrepreneur at heart. In 2000, 
let's see, 2018, uh, a random introduction between me and my current co-founders basically led to the opportunity of founding the current project. So my two co-founders are technocrats. They have been programming and being interested in the crypto space for a while. They're also crypto traders. And they basically wanted to create a coin that addresses all the issues that they see in the more mainstream cryptos. And one particular coin that we're, we were sort of inspired after was Nano. So Nano basically positioned itself as a fee-less cryptocurrency at the time. And the one problem is that Nano did not have smart contract attached with it. And at the time, Nano community did not have plans to build the smart contract capability. It's sort of parallel to Vitalik wanting to build Ethereum when the BTC community rejected his idea of building smart contracts. So the three of us basically went in and started trying our hands on building Vite, which is inspired by the architecture of the Nano block lattice DAG ledger architecture. And then we added on top of that the DPoS consensus algorithm and subsequently created a zero fee, high throughput, low latency cryptocurrency with smart contract capabilities. And so our mainnet launched about a year ago and our, the main flagship product on top of Vite right now is a decentralized exchange. And thanks to the efficient architecture of the public blockchain underneath the decentralized exchange, trades can settle instantaneously on the DEX and at zero cost in the underlying blockchain level. The only fee is assessed at the exchange level, similar to any other trading platforms out there. Apart from this, we also have a wallet that not only supports VIT native coins and tokens issued on VIT, but also ETH and notoriously difficult to support and integrate GRIN. And we're looking to add more coins to this plethora of, of projects that we support in our wallet. Now, for those who may not be familiar, you mentioned that y'all are um, utilizing a decentralized proof of stake um, consensus mechanism. Um, what is decentralized proof of stake? Right, so DPoS or delegated proof of stake is oh, sort of Delegate. best characterized as a representative democracy. So the way Bitcoin and Ethereum works is a full-blown democracy where anyone can become a validator or miner and have a say in what the true nature of the ledger is. The main issue with that is basically a matter of throughput or TPS to put it very crudely, transactions per second. So just intuitively, it's a lot easier to get a small, smaller number of people to agree on something than a large number of people to agree on something. So we were inspired by EOS in this sense because they were the champion of the DPoS consensus algorithm. And essentially we have 50 super nodes or what we call snapshot block producers. And they basically take turns to snapshot the network and dictate the, the, the nature of the ledger. Now, if uh, we basically set up our network in such a way that a certain threshold of super nodes have to collude in order to perform a successful attack. And that threshold is a third. And so we believe that this mechanism is a good trade-off between the kind of throughput that a real world mass adopted application would require and the type of security that a decentralized network would mandate. And um, what is that threshold of, um of um, collusion between the super nodes that would uh, compromise the security of the network. It's a third. A third, okay. Yeah, which is still, yeah, like if you're working with um, 50 uh, um, master nodes or um, super nodes, that's still um, quite a bit. Now, how, right. how does this um, enable uh, essentially fee-less transactions on the network? So the... 
DPoS part of it is not directly associated with the fees. The way we have basically settled the fees is a couple of different things. Number one is there is a inflation schedule of 3% per year that gets rewarded to the super nodes or the snapshot block producers. And that's how they basically get paid. And this is con in contrast to Bitcoin where the transaction fees are paid by the transaction makers and subsequently go to the miner that successfully solves the block first. In our case, it's just perpetual inflation schedule that basically gets rewarded to the small group of uh, super delegates. And the annual inflation is only 3%. It doesn't need to be extremely high because we do not have a large amount of snapshot block producers to begin with. I see. So it's like instead of on the Ethereum network where sort of a user has to kind of contribute a portion of the fees that get paid out to miners with a fee that's tacked onto their transaction, you just kind of, um, you sort of allow the sort of rate of inflation to pay out the um, master nodes, which are sort of processing all those transactions to kind of alleviate that burden from the um, users who might want to make transactions on the network beneath them. Like, is that yeah, right? yeah, that's correct. So the inflation basically sort of devalues every single coin holder, right? So it's in a way, if you hold a VEAT and you don't do anything with it, and every year it, the intrinsic value supposedly drops by 3% because the supply increases by 3%. But we're hoping that can be counteracted by the increase in value of the network due to the increase in usage from projects being built on top of it, such as the decentralized exchange Mitex that I previously mentioned. Yeah, so um, maybe we can kind of move into that. How does that actually benefit the uh, DeFi um, ecosystem that y'all are trying to build on top of it? And sort of how does this kind of lend itself to the uh, workings of your decentralized exchange? Maybe you can say a bit about that. Yeah, I think the zero fee nature certainly helps with any sort of the app being built on top of this infrastructure. But before that, I also would be remiss to not mention this. So the way it works in our network is that even though transactions are free, in order to have higher quota or higher transactions per second for your DApp, you need to stake a certain amount of VEAT. So the, basically, you can think of it this way. The more VEAT you stake, the, high, the fatter your pipe gets. And if you're doing high frequency trading on a exchange, then you naturally want to stake VEAT and that increases the, uh, the demand for this currency. Now, so going back to how this infrastructure has been helping with our decentralized exchange. So what we found is that the basic infrastructure has certainly contributed to the performance. Now, lots of decentralized exchanges built on Ethereum, which are the most popular sort of decentralized exchanges, do not actually have on-chain matching engine or on-chain order books. So a lot of these mechanisms are actually done on an off-chain basis. And that's not what we're after. So basically, thanks to our infrastructure, we're able to bring both of those mechanisms on chain. Now, the truth is running a decentralized exchange these days, a big part of draw for users is actually liquidity, the types of coins that are on there, and ultimately a sense of security. So I think the decentralized nature sort of helps solve the security part a little bit, but we're still working on ramping up the first two parts, which is liquidity, and the types of coins people have access to. So what we've also been trying to differentiate ourselves a little bit is we've noticed that some of the bigger players generally have coins and generally have the mainstream coins traded on their platform with very high liquidity. And any kind of coin that gets on those big platforms because of the wide reach of those platforms gets a big pump, gets a lot of attention. So we try to compete in a different way where we basically try to find coins that do not necessarily have as much a following, but potentially has room to grow. So some of the coins that we've actually listed fall into those categories and they have a small but sort of loyal following. Somehow those coins did not get picked up by the larger platforms out there and we list them on our platform. 
And this is our mechanism to boost the liquidity and the diversity of coins on our platform. Sure. So it's kind of like you have a um, you have a um, vetting process, if you will, where you kind of go and find lower cap, micro cap coins that have, you know, presumably a large and strong uh, following or a large and strong um, community behind it, so that you can kind of safeguard the people that are uh, participating in the decentralized exchange from, you know, uh, your classic pump and dump rug pool or something like that. Is that like is that kind of right. the idea? You can think of it that way. And then another unique aspect is we have this concept of gateways. A gateway is essentially a mini decentralized exchange. And anyone can run such a gateway on top of our protocol. And after you run your gateway, you can list your coins on there. You can collect fees that are the income of the decentralized exchange. So listing fees, for example, and transaction fees above a certain threshold. And the transaction fees that the, the base, there's a certain base amount of transaction fees that get distributed to holders of the platform coins VX. But anything beyond that is gravy for the gateway operators to collect. Sure. So it has to move in a series of steps, if you will, you know, because I was thinking automatically like certain people in the space might sort of complain that that's uh, right. You know, that that's quite literally gatekeeping. They say, oh, it's not really open source or it's not, um, you know, um, open access. But you're saying that it's that it's still kind of an automated process, right? You don't have any um, select a group of people kind of behind the scenes making that pick. It's just to say that you have to sort of like the like the contracts are written such that, you know, at that gatekeeping phase, you have to perform at a certain level before you can move on to, I guess, get officially listed. Like, is that what's going on? Yeah, well, the way this works is that anyone can become a gateway. And that's the decentralization aspect of it. So if you were to try to get your coin listed on a certain gateway and get rejected, that is the freedom of that gateway to, to make that decision. But if you really want a coin listed and you can't find a gateway that wants to list it, you can make your own gateway. So that's how this works here. So you know, if you try to get a coin listed on Binance, they reject you, there's no other Binance to go to. But the way it works on our platform is that you can basically run your gateway on our protocol as you wish. And then you can list your coin on, and, and if nobody accepts your coin, you can make your own gateway and list it there. Mm-hmm. Great. And so um, is it like, is the decentralized exchange um, uh, protocol agnostic? Is it kind of like you can bring in, I mean, I mean, like, what's the deal here? Are like, if you want to bring BTC or sort of ET H on chain or something, uh, does it turn into a kind of wrapped asset? Yes, or? yes. So... Wrap token and the gateway essentially is a place where you would deposit the alien asset, BTC, ETH, and then receive a native version of that asset or wrap token. And then after that point, all your transactions will be fully decentralized with no third party middleman. And so there is a room for improvement in terms of decentralization at the gateway level, because that's where you leave your assets. And we're trying to improve that architecture by making it a multi-sig gateway. And we're releasing our 2.0 architecture likely at the end of this year to basically share how we plan to upgrade our gateways for higher security and decentralization. Got it. So now this kind of brings me to um, circle back to something that you started out with, where you uh, mentioned that the origins of V, uh, I guess, emerged from, um, you know, a, as you put it, a kind of like a re- rejection of the sort of um, nano um, community or um, something to that effect, where kind of sort of you were impressed by what Nano was doing, uh, but it didn't quite fit in with their uh, protocol. So you so you and your co-founder sort of ventured to, you know, um, learn some lessons from what they had going on and then build something from the ground up yourselves. Um, this, I think, homes in on something which is very prominent in the space and which will allow us to kind of segue a bit into your uh, podcast is that um, there's a lot of disagreement 
but uh, it's not necessarily vicious disagreement, right? I think that it's the kind of disagreement which is enabled by the freedom of the space, right? To sort of move about and kind of do things at will, thanks to the technologies that we have available to us with the internet and, um, you know, just it's in the nature of open source, uh, decentralized um, um, community efforts, right? Right. How, uh, sort of what are you doing with your podcast? Because you mentioned that it sort of showcases some of the substantial disagreements between leaders in the space. Um, right. it, like did, did, did the origins of Veet out of that kind of uh, bifurcation from sort of what you saw happening in uh, Nano, did that lead to what you're doing uh, with the podcast? Maybe you can speak a little bit about sort of what you're doing there and why you think that it's so important, um, right. how um, you focus on right. the um, disagreements. So, yeah, I would say the inspiration for the founding of Veet actually did not directly contribute to this idea of starting this podcast. The podcast came out primarily because I think the industry was going through some collective soul searching, basically in a few different ways. Number one is there's disagreement in terms of the practicality of our use cases. So lots of things have been promised by blockchain, right? So enterprise blockchain, blockchain-based supply chain tracking and you know, like wildlife tracking and things of that nature. Ultimately, I think the true use cases being delivered right now seems to be an alternative way of financial transactions or DeFi and digital gold, which is storage of value, right? And BTC is the most prominent example of that. But there, I think it, there's a big disillusionment when it comes to understanding for what blockchain can and cannot do. And there's some disagreement within the space about it. So that's the first sort of soul searching I think the industry was going through. The second one is that there are different factions in the space and anyone taking one piece of that faction very much acts like a religious zealot that fully believes in that particular the doctrines of that particular faction and discredits the other sides. Now, so in that sense, not everyone can be correct. And I sometimes can be just as confused as another bystander. And I thought it would be really interesting to get the conversation on in live podcasting format. I mean, you see Twitter fights all the time, right? So, but Twitter is not it's not as real time, it's less nuanced, character limits. So I think it makes more sense to get people to debate live with each other. So based on those two reasons, I launched this podcast. And like you said, it's an effort to bring thought leaders from the industry and discuss a hot button topic of the day. So we had no coiners on as well. So we had two no coiners, one is a smart contract skeptic, one was a everything blockchain skeptic. So, you know, no Bitcoin, no Libra, and so no enterprise blockchain, anything of that nature. And then we've had people that discuss purely technical aspects. You know, like for example, recently we had people debate the roll-up strategies, ZK version of the roll-up versus optimistic roll-up. Um, so, and then, we also have people come in and discuss macroeconomic aspects that are relevant to crypto. So when the Fed, the US Fed was printing like crazy at the beginning of the most recent crisis, there was a lot of debate about whether it was legitimate to bail out these companies and whether it was fair for companies that were closest to the spigot of money to consume all these resources at the expense of the rest of society. So we had someone debate, take on the side of defending the Fed and uh, someone uh, attacking that position. So, so far we've had, I think 15 episodes and we published on a bi-weekly basis. I think we have a niche, but growing. Uh, we have a, we, we've hit a niche content base and we've, we have a small but uh, I think loyal following 
And I look forward to basically bringing more people on and discussing other topics that divide us in the blockchain space. Yeah, you know, I think that it, that that's a really valuable contribution to the space because, as you mentioned, we, you know, those of us who are active on uh, crypto Twitter, as they call it, um, you see these kind of uh, debates play out all the time. I don't even know if you'd want to call them debates, right? They're just little uh, 160 word or, you know, 160 character um, bickerings, if you will, back and forth. And, you know, everyone gets to hide kind of behind a screen and it's very easy to feel powerful, especially when you um, have a kind of biased opinion towards the sort of um, religious rights of your uh, preferred uh, protocol, if you will. So I think that it's great that you can bring people on because those kinds of issues really need to be worked out in long form discussion. You know, it's like this is one of the um, sort of um, criticisms that we could launch at, you know, the attempt to have a presidential debate. You know, really, they're trying to like compact and confine answers in a very short amount of time. And the whole thing takes place over yet another uh, relatively short period of time. But I don't think that that's conducive to actually, you know, um, carrying out rational, you know, um, diplomatic conversations, which can sort of end with people, you know, if for lack of a better way of putting it, you know, agreeing to disagree, if you will, or sort of accepting that maybe the space is overall better when we have um, these, you know, little nation states, as Scott Smiley would uh, put the different um, protocols, you know, just kind of staying to their own and giving people the freedom to jump uh, to and fro. So you had mentioned that um, one of the categories that you've already showcased on the podcast were you know no coiners versus people that may maxis uh, right you know maxis people or the people that generally believe in the philosophy of what is going on with this technological revolution um what did you find to be the sort of the sort of basic tenets of that um disagreement there between the no coiner and you know the uh, proponent so i think that the no coiners generally believe that Bitcoin is confined to is confined to a use case similar to when the to tulip bulbs were popular in Europe hundreds of years ago. That was a time when tulip bulbs served as a store of value for a very short period of time and generated a lot of frenzy, made a lot of people rich, but then the wealth also vanished after people realized it had no value. So I think the main basis for the no coiners is still in that the value of these cryptocurrencies have no real basis. And there are a couple other arguments associated with this. So one is that a lot of the price action might have to do with shady behavior from certain market participants, namely Tether, right? So there has already been some evidence to the types of activities that they did to inflate the price of the currency. I don't know if there is sufficient proof today though as to the fact that Tether plays a huge role in supporting the price today. I think I, I, I actually think that there's a, a lot of very strong evidence in terms of mainstream adoption of Bitcoin is the store of value narrative. So I'm very interested in, and this debate was about a year ago, December of last year. So I'm happy to have them back and renew their disagreement. So far, based on Twitter, it just seems that the no coiner, in this case was David Gerard, the, the author of the 50 foot block, the attack the 50 foot blockchain. Uh, so far, I don't think he's changed his mind, but I think he might need to update his brief a little bit, so to speak. Sure. Yeah, especially now looking at kind of how this kind of up and coming bull rally is going, you know, it seems like it's driven in large part by, um, you know, big industry players that are putting, you know, like, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in there. I mean, like you look at Michael Saylor, for example, he's, you know, announcing to the public that, you know, not only him personally, but he's 
uh, putting a large amount of uh, micro strategies and treasury into Bitcoin, you know, almost 100%, I think he said, you know, no other assets, no other, um, you know, no other um, 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 commodities or anything. It's all like, it's all Bitcoin. So I think it would be interesting to see sort of that conversation revisited in light of uh, some of the large industry players that are um, sort of making their way into this space yeah. now. I think the if you think about gold as the store of value today recognized by countries and and just society as a way to store value. So the thing about gold is that it does have physical value. You can, there are certain things that you can do with gold, but you can't with other sorts of precious metal. And gold has obviously been perceived that way for many years. So it's got a long first mover advantage, if you will, over Bitcoin. But I think that it, the gold's social value significantly exceeds its physical value. And that has a lot to do with the sort of social consensus that has been formed. And I think that has, there's, a, there's a tipping point when it comes to social consensus of these things, when a certain fraction of people believe that a certain idea is true, that idea can reflexively become true as a result. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that fraction has, what that fraction is and whether it has been achieved, mm -hmm. but I think it's quite clear that over the last 10 years, we're moving towards that direction. So the thing about um, crypto and BTC in particular as a store of value is that it, it is limited in supply. It, it is easier to transport, easier to divide, and it has um, it, and in fact, it, the the fact that it is in limited supply, that quality actually even exceeds that for gold because for gold you don't know mathematically if that's true, and and yes, again, like you said, a bunch of traditional finance people are moving into throwing their hat into the space, and recently Warren Buffett actually started buying gold. Well, so to be very clear, he was purchasing the stock of a gold mining company. So it's not only gold outright, but it is a leverage bet on gold itself. And obviously he said some very negative things about Bitcoin, but he's also said very negative things about gold, maybe say 10 years ago in one of his regulatory filings, sorry, in one of his uh, annual letters, he basically mentioned that the all the gold in the world can fill some swimming pool and it doesn't generate any income. The fact that it's limited doesn't mean it's it will provide cash flow, and that's not something you can buy into. But then he changed his mind, or at least one of his investment managers did. So I don't know if that necessarily generates momentum for moving from the analog digital analog store of value to digital store of value at some point. Now you had mentioned about gold that uh, we can't really mathematically determine the sort of um, supply, right? Like, uh, for example, you know, uh, one of the arguments you hear people say is, well, what happens if an asteroid hits and it happens to be filled with gold or it happens to be made out of gold? You know, it seems like all of a sudden you have uh, like an inflation of gold, which we didn't expect because we thought we knew the fixed, you know, supply here on earth. Um, there's there's a um, similar problem that we face in, you know, central bank fiat uh, currencies, you know, where um, they can sort of take the leisure to, you know, print money to, you know, cover national debts or to send out stimulus into the economy and what have you. Um, and as you mentioned, we can't really do this with Bitcoin, right? There's a fixed um, 21 million or something just shy of uh, 21 million that will ever be there. And it's that sort of basic supply and demand principle where the, uh, you know, the demand can always increase, but the supply can't, right? And that's why people are saying like, okay, well, it's got this, 
you know, this basic um, supply and demand principle grounding it, but also, you know, it is a kind of, it's sort of, um, it's a sort of each Bitcoin that comes into existence is a proof of of someone's work, right? They're kind of, they're sort of transferring um, energy and computing power into some aspect of the security of the network. And so I think that what a lot of these people are seeing uh, to be attractive about Bitcoin as a store of value is that it um, is that it sort of uh, um, covers all these grounds. Now, this gets me to my next question and sort of we can kind of uh, start to close it out with this. Um, we've seen a lot of money printing, right? We've seen uh, this sort of hyperinflation on the horizon with the US dollar, for example. Um, what do you think, like, does that figure into your reflections on uh, 2020 as as a sort of really important moment for the cryptocurrency revolution in general? Um, and if, if so, or if not, uh, what else do you think was one of the most important moments for uh, 2020 to ensure the success of this space going forward? Right, right. So before I comment on whether 2020 was some kind of watershed moment. I also want to mention another interesting episode we had on our podcast about nation state attacks on Bitcoin. So even if people believe in the narrative that Bitcoin is a better store of value than gold, how do we know that governments won't come out to suppress its development? And they have very legitimate and, and regulatory reasons to do so. By the way, Ray Dalio, the founder of Bridgewater Associates, one of the richest men in the world, came out recently. And on Twitter, he basically echoed the same sentiment, which is he's wondering if government can shut it down, right? So that particular episode basically laid out the arguments on both sides. And I would say my main takeaway is that it's entirely possible that Bitcoin stays under the radar and not get attacked because its market value might not be so high as to warrant attention. So right now, the market value of Bitcoin, I believe is less than 10% of gold. So it's becoming more of a threat to the store value status of gold, but not nearly there. As in, it could still double from this point and all of us with skin in the game would, would be, by now would be able to you know, make uh, a tidy sum without Bitcoin having become such a big deal to, to be shut down by certain governments. And also we're seeing more and more stakeholders in the ruling class that are, have become Bitcoin advocates. You got the Bitcoin lobbyist arms, you got senators actually explicitly endorsing Bitcoin. You got someone that used to run an exchange that's now in the runoff race in Georgia to be the Senate, to be in the Senate. So anyway, so that sort of wraps up my my theorizing of the Bitcoin uh, Bitcoiner versus no coiner conversation. But to answer your question about 2020, mm -hmm. I think 2020 was a big year for money in general, and there's a few different themes. So number one, we already mentioned Bitcoin reaching all time high. Number two, I think that there's a there's a there's I think one of the major world powers, namely America, is, ha is experiencing serious trouble, right? I mean, you can probably think about four different crises going on right now. There's the pandemic, there's racial riots, there's a political, a very serious political crisis, and there's an economic crisis. And so I, I think that America, um, as a result, has really taken the beating in terms of its international image. And practically speaking, because of the economic hot water that we're in, the Fed has stepped in and basically mortgaging the future of this country's citizens to pay for the debt right now, namely to feed people that don't have income, don't have a job because they have to stay at home. And there's another country basically rising in power as a result of all of this. And that country has been gaining power for a long time, and that is namely China. And I think it's very emblematic that the virus supposedly came from there, but it's basically under control there now. Um, I'm talking to my friends there and 
people are uh, hanging out outside without a need to wear masks and all economic activities have basically resumed to and normalized. Whereas the US is just in a hot mess. We still have yet to decide if it's okay to wear masks and if it's if it makes sense to have a national lockdown and so forth. And this comes back to the concept of money because China is on the cusp of releasing their CBDC, right? And America is debating whether to have a CBDC. And I think one telling fact is that the paper money is actually one transmitter of virus. So very ironically, all this comes back together. So I think the second theme that is related to money is this idea that digital money is transforming a way a developing nation is going to increasingly gain power relative to the incumbent that has been touting a reserve currency of the world for a long time. And the third thing I think is actually DeFi. And I think there are two aspects that I haven't seen before in DeFi that are quite interesting. One is flash loans and the other one is liquidation, liquidity migration. So, so flash loans, this is definitely not something you can do in traditional finance. You hypothetically set up a financial transaction where you can do whatever you want with the money borrowed as long as you can algorithm it, algorithmically prove that you can give back the money at the end of that transaction. And this has toppled many a DeFi protocol out there, but this is a brand new phenomena that I think the traditional finance simply has not seen and are still trying to digest the implication of. And the second interesting about DeFi is liquidity migration. And for example, sushi swap, basically taking, usurping lots of liquidity from, uh, from Uniswap as a result of in, uh, setting up this new mechanism where someone can run a piece of code to migrate the liquidity in return, you get some, some coin on sushi swap that presumably has value. So I think DeFi is definitely in a very crazy space. And because of its open nature, I think people will be jump and also the lucrative potential, people will be jumping in both feet and building even newer and, and perhaps scarier things that we have yet to encounter this year. But 2020 definitely has seen the tip of the iceberg there. So yep, yeah, man. so I would say, you know, 2020 has been a, a a really interesting year for money. Yeah, it's uh, definitely, I think, um, I mean, those are some really great um, insights, by the way. Uh, I think that 2020 has been really a kind of test run, you know, for um, a lot of what uh, this space has been chalked up to be, you know, intended for in the past. So, um, right. and by I, the way, on the DeFi part, I, I need to give credit to the person that alluded me to all of this. And that was one of the debaters on the topic of whether yield farming is innovation or not. And this was from Hasib Qureshi. And he was the one that pointed out the fact that these two phenomena are brand new and very interesting to watch within the DeFi space. But continue. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, that sort of brings up another great point that this, that like a lot of what's going on here is really unprecedented. So it is hard to, you know, sort of really gauge just what um, sort of level of um, innovation is taking place and kind of what needs to happen next. Yeah. So that, so that sort of leads me to this kind of last question. Do you have any last words? Um, what do you think uh, will be, um, the sort of shape of things going forward. Uh, you got price predictions. What are you excited about on the horizon as far as applications, products, anything? Yeah, so unfortunately what I'm going to say is going to be sort of conventional in our space at least. Maybe a no-coiner would think it's, uh, it's crazy, but for example, I think the Bitcoin digital store of value status will continue and will be solidified. And I would not be surprised if someone like Ray Dalio throws in the hat. And if he does that, it'd be game over. Like you should buy all the Bitcoin you can afford right now in anticipation of that possibility. And I think for altcoins, there will be an interesting opportunity to shine with these mainstream, mainstream pioneer cryptos have their spotlight and 
I believe that there will be a renewed interest in building an alternative financial system as the craze in DeFi has shown us. And, you know, the, the, the flow, the ebb and flow, they come and go, right? And right now, I think it took a very, very short time for DeFi to bounce back, at least in terms of price action. And I think that any kind of low or slow activity would probably be fairly abbreviated when it comes to uh, these DeFi protocols. So, yeah, so there you have it. I, I don't think I have anything unconventional to say, but maybe just reaffirming one's belief in the excitement that's happening in the space next year. I think it's here to stay, man. Well, Richard Yan, co-founder and CEO of Veet Labs, also host of the podcast, the Blockchain Debate podcast. Um, where can people find the podcast? Uh, where can people visit um, Veet on the webs to learn more, follow you on social medias? What's your plug there? Yeah, so we have four Twitter accounts. Now, so Vite Labs is just V-I-T-E Labs on Twitter. VTEX Exchange is V-I-T-E-X Exchange. And my personal account is Gentso09, G-E-N-T-S-O-09. And the Blockchain Debate Podcast is Block Debate. Got it. Well, Richard, thanks so much for taking some time to chat with me today. Everyone else... Stay tuned to reimagine 2020 V5.0 and happy hodl days.